All right, hello everyone, and welcome to my channel. Uh, it's an educational channel. We take a look at great theories of everything, all-encompassing theories, um, syncretic or synthetic, uh, you know, uh, potential theories with syncretic potential. Uh, grand unified theories, magnum opuses, tour de forces, and um, mostly obscure things that you probably haven't heard of. And uh, then, um, and you know, also including the history of those things. And um, today is our second video that we've done on the book called it's um, after the end of the world don't you know that yet and uh, this all has to do with uh, um, so-called uh, jazz musicians in the 50s and 60s and this is really a part of the reciprocal church so uh, kind of trying to pick up the pieces of the Western religions and uh, add a few things into them uh, syncretically and to be able to form something out of the ashes and uh, move it along. Um, so this is a recommendation as far as that is concerned. And um, this section, uh, we are in the introduction and uh, we're about to start section four called Representation and Repetition. I shall employ a long view of history to show how Various secular consumer worldviews have been installed gradually into Western music via the entertainment house and the technologies of radio and recording over the first half of the 20th century. These forms of communication enable their purveyors to represent and repeat the music according to their specifications. These secular consumer worldviews eventually displaced the primordial sacred musical worldview of sacrificing, which refers to a ritual practice to help traditional people survive because it was a catharsis for accumulated tension. Uh, and that all comes from uh, one of these globalist uh, economists, Jacques Attali, political economy of music, noise, the political economy of music. Uh, in the second half of the 20th century, African-American jazz musicians mounted a unique organized resistance to both of these secular mindsets. First, bebop musicians of the 1940s and early 1950s opposed the expectations of entertainment that were prevalent in the 1930s swing music. They were, however, held back because they left themselves exposed to the institutional hazards of corruption, overconsumption, and addiction. Many of the musicians also became attached to the musical rating system set up by Bebop's new critical establishment. By the late 1950s and 1960s, these institutional forces had combined to neutralize the oppositional victory of bebop. In the 1960s, however, creative musicians went beyond bebop by attempting to take their music to an even higher level of awareness. In particular, they defended themselves against the temptations of corruption, overconsumption, and addiction that emanated from the jazz institutions and their technologies. They attempted to tune into the sacrificing worldview of a sacred music, music tradition. They then attempted to spread this higher awareness to their listeners. Sun Ra's orchestra and the AACM were two major contributors to this movement. Uh, Jacques Attali in his book Noise, The Political Economy of Music, argues that these musicians of the 1960s failed in their attempt to transcend the jazz institutions, but he was premature in his verdict. As Atali himself has documented, it took several generations for the establishment mindset to sink into Western music 
It may also take decades for their accumulation, accumulated influence to be displaced. The creative musicians, in fact, prepared for a protracted struggle, knowing that they must survive the first few generations before a creative music mindset could sink in as an alternative worldview in American and world music. It is important to take this long view of history when appraising the black creative musicians' efforts. Uh, okay, this is uh, section five called historiography. During my research by, uh, dividing my research by chapter helps to explain the sources I utilized. The background material in chapters one and two is heavily indebted to many publications by Sun Ra scholars, especially John F. Schwed's Landmark Space is the Place, the full, first full-length biography of Sun Ra. Other lesser known works include Hartmut Gierken's Omniverse Sun Ra, a set of collected essays on Sun Ra's orchestra, and Alan Chase's extensive ethnomusicology MA thesis on Sun Ra's orchestra. This work, however, goes beyond those by drawing on new material, uh, and that's new like as of 15 years ago. So, two brothers in California, John and Peter Hines, consistently have been conducting interviews with Sun Ra and his orchestra whenever they toured California. With steady perseverance, the Hineses have painstakingly published 41 issues and counting of Sun Ra research which is comprised of transcribed interviews, pictures, and other ephemera. One may argue that these interviews are clouded by nostalgia and short memories, and they translated Sun Ra's myth to tell his story the way he wanted it to be told. But I found the account so consistent over time that I generally felt confident working with Sun Ra research. In addition, I relied extensively upon contribu uh, contributions to the Sun Ra listserv, as primarily a lurker on this list over the past decade of its operation, I've read hundreds of valuable first-hand accounts, narratives, and vignettes from Sun Ra's cult following across the world. Many musicians also posted to the list, while several scholars, including Schwed and discographer Robert Campbell, have contributed to the list. Most of the posts have been from either record collectors or Sun Ra fanatics. Chapter three focuses on the New York free jazz musicians and was fueled mostly by trade journal interviews and articles on them. While I uh, drew from about two dozen publications, the most useful by, by far was Downbeat Magazine. Its mainstream orientation provided the clearest juxtaposition between the critics and the musicians' approaches to this music. For a more subcultural view, I also relied on the Liberator and the Village Voice for secondary background source background on New York. I utilized three books in particular, Eckhart Yost's Free Jazz, John Litweiler's The Freedom Principle, and Valerie Wilmer's As Serious as Your Life, Story of the New Jazz. I recommend all of these, but found Wilmer's particularly helpful because it concentrates on the actual lives of the musicians, and it lets them speak more than the others. All of these works have valuable chapters on the contemporaneous Chicago movement, but for chapters four through six, I found myself to a large extent on new territory. The only extensive scholarly work on the AACM being Arthur Cromwell's 1998 sociology uh, dissertation, which presents a large amount of verbal testimony from the musicians. Um, now, I guess this is uh, before George Lewis's book could come out. Um, at least the original version of this was from that before then. Um, but George Lewis has written a kind of a, the so-called definitive book on the ACM. Um, and th I mean, that was a long time ago, 20 years ago. In my research for these chapters, I collected interviews from Downbeat and many European journals, and I found liner notes to be revealing. More important were the oral interviews I conducted with four of the AACM musicians, Madada Leo Smith, Fred Anderson, George Lewis, and Roscoe Mitchell. 
These combined with the writings of the musicians themselves place me on firm ground. Of most notable use was Anthony Braxton's three-volume Triaxiom writings. Still, the most important source for me was the opportunity to experience the musicians play in person, as I have on a few dozen, dozen occasions. At these times, I was able to get close to the optimal setting intended by the musicians. To augment this source, I experienced and studied over 200 of their record albums and compact discs. As we shall see, the musicians understood the historical process of documentation, and so their own recordings were made precisely for this kind of research. Finally, I attempted to resume my own musical practices that I began on the piano when I was very young. Playing music myself helped me to appreciate some of the musicians' viewpoints. In this work then, written sources have been greatly augmented by my experiential practices into the music. Once again, however, this work is merely an introduction to creative music and no substitute for the experience of listening or playing the music itself. This work makes no pretenses of being a comprehensive work of this vast unexplored topic, but is rather a personal description of the various aspects of creative music that have been important to the author's own understanding. My hope is to inspire others to experience the music for themselves and to document their own findings. For the benefit of humanity, this topic is in great need of attention from serious researchers. Okay, uh, that's the end of the introduction. And I kind of have to maneuver back here and see if I can find the first chapter. All righty. Uh, the first chapter, chapter one, called Calling Planet Earth. And here is the introduction to chapter one. Sun Ra arrived on this planet as a baby in Birmingham, Alabama, sometime around May 1914. His generation was the first to grow up under the full force of mass media consumer technology, the phonograph, the motion picture, the radio, and eventually the television. These technologies, according to Sun Ra, helped bring us to after the end of the world because they caused us to lose track of our code for living. Sun Ra charged the date of his birth with symbolic importance without even telling us the exact date. He often claimed that he was thousands of years old. Ra's evasion of historical inquiry has taken its toll on the scholarship. For example, there have been estimates for his birth date ranging from 1910 to 1928, with several dates in between, but always in Gemini. Sun Ra is best known for his music and justifiably so for the many thousands, he claimed plausibly tens of millions of listeners throughout the world who have become intensely devoted to his music, a cult following. Sun Ra privately distributed at least several dozen albums on his own do-it-yourself label. It's called Saturn Inc. So no one really knows how many listeners he had. Upon listening, though, I found much that much of Sun Ra's more traditional music is indeed quite beautiful in a traditional way. And for the most part, even his critics give him that. Associates have recalled that Sun Ra was like an encyclopedia of jazz. In a sense, he lived at least three consecutive lives in jazz, in swing bebop and post bebop, from about 1928 to 1993. His broad perspective gave him the ability to see and reflect the whole history of the music better than most others, but it is for more esoteric reasons that Sun Ra will be studied here. Sun Ra's music, powered by creative discipline, utilized higher forces for a musical inversion, specifically designed to 
shock people out of their trance, to wake them up. His inversion was to direct us out of the end of the world and into a new world he called space. Unfortunately, this point is only beginning to be understood over 15 years after Sun Ra has left the planet. So now that's over 30 years after Sun Ra has left the planet, and 80 years after he began this lifelong musical quest, which is now almost 196. Uh, America failed to heed Sun Ra's message while he was still with us. Predictably, since his death, our historical knowledge of him has improved leaps and, leaps and bounds. Just before his passing, internationally distributed evidence records issued a spate of rare Saturn records from the Sun Ra Orchestra on CD, giving the younger generation a fighting chance to discover him and giving the older generation a second chance. Then in 1997, anthropologist John Schwed brought the full scope of Ra's life into the margins of the respectable academic world, the space is the place of lives and times of Sun Ra. Schwed provided a major step forward in pinning down Sun Ra's myster mysterious life, accepting a challenge Ra set down when he said that people of Earth would never find his greatest contributions because they don't deserve it. There is still a long way to go, but Schwed's book is a close is close to a definitive objective work on such an enigmatic figure. Ken Burns, however, in his celebrated so-called comprehensive documentary of jazz, omitted Sun Ra entirely. Schwed, much less Burns, however, did not produce a Kabbalistic history of the music. Historical facts are available to the extent to which we can use them to help us live our lives but they don't show us how to live our lives. A creative approach will show the limited nature of an objective approach, underlining the need to learn to think like Sun Ra, like, as he would claim, an alien, before the whole picture can come into place. Indeed, one of the main things Schwed's impressive work shows is that the more we know about Sun Ra, the more we don't know about him. Instead, we have to experience him by facing his music in its full dimensions. Otherwise, Sun Ra's life resists analysis because he was working from a mysterious code, which we still haven't understood, his myth. Once this radical worldview was revealed to him, he conscientiously objected to the culture of which he had been a part and gradually built an inverted alternative substitute culture. Sun Ra's creativity cannot be approached with our current worldview in place, but instead requires a beginner's mind. As Ra himself used to preach, it is best to proceed from your ignorance, not from your intelligence because your ignorance is infinite. With simple inverted perspectives like this one, Sun Ra turned conventional thinking upside down and inside out to demonstrate that what we thought was in fact, was fact, is really no more than assumptions projected through the belief in a built-in worldview. Only by admitting our ignorance and proceeding from there are we able to approach the music and mythology left behind by Sun Ra. For example, I may not be able to believe that Sun Ra was an alien, but if I can't, then I have to learn to give him the benefit of the doubt, because that is what he claimed. By starting with this initial deference, patterns emerged as this study continued and the picture began to come uh, into relief. Research revealed that Sun Ra's myth made sense to him and to many others. I began to see all of the sacrifices he made to stay true to his stated purpose and how clear and calculating his mind was. It became easier to suspend criticism to declare that I just don't understand when he said something that flew in the face of rational belief. 
So for the purposes of this work, we will examine Sun Ra's life in a creative manner, according to his own myth, even at the risk of becoming unscientific or ahistorical. From there, the emergent uh, central elements of Sun Ra's practice, praxis will be explored, all the while pointing out areas of Sun Ra's life that are puzzling from a historiographical point of view, areas whose re resolution might help us understand this figure who sometimes quipped, history, that's his story. My story is a mystery. Indeed, that Sun Ra's life was not worthy of historical treatment until 1997 is a testament not only to Ra's ability to be elusive, but also to the power of the mediated worldview, which shields the public from things not only behind the veil, but also beyond the pale. This can be seen in that even Sun Ra's musical supporters often failed to take his mythology seriously, suppressing a fear that they might get their own worldview or even sanity question if they did. For example, Ed O. Bland, maker of a 1959 film called The Cry of Jazz, featuring Sun Ra and his band in Chicago, was a tireless promoter of Sun Ra's music in the years around 1960, but was constantly put off by all of that sun god of jazz propaganda. Unlike Bland, who most listeners took the alternate, alternate route of denying Sun Ra's message to mankind, they didn't deny his space, space myth outright, but instead assumed that it was all just an act, a promotional device that Sun Ra himself did not even take seriously. This position is seriously in error according to the available evidence. This chapter will demonstrate above all that Sun Ra's mythology was not a put on, but instead was an inverted belief system to which he continuously referred both on and off stage. Moreover, it will argue that his approach was not irrational but arose completely consciously, logically, and even strategically out of his own experiences in black music and religion. Sun Ra was in effect conscientiously objecting to his given role as a commercial musician and putting his own inverted worldview and mythic society in its place with black musician as heal, healer, uh, sorry, healer and savior. Okay, I think we're going to stop right there. Um, this next section, section two, is called Black Birmingham Family Life. So we'll learn a little bit about Sunrise Early Life here. Um, when you join me tomorrow, um, we will resume at this spot. So thanks for tuning in today. Have a great day.